Rising above the city of Vienna, an imposing fusion of steel and concrete emerges. A visual symphony that demands attention and inspires a sense of wonder. This singular structure represents one of the chilling flak towers, product of Nazi construction during World War II. But yet, in defiance of time, this foreboding structure holds within its walls a story waiting to be unveiled. So, what's the history of the Flak Towers? In the immediate aftermath of the British Royal Air Force's bombing raid on Berlin in 1940, Adolf Hitler initiated a reassessment of Nazi defences against a formidable and capable air force threat. Initially, their strategy involved targeting British cities, aiming to strain RAF forces and undermine morale. Concurrently, they fortified the internal defences of their own cities. Under Hitler's directive, the imposing flak towers were commissioned, initiating in Berlin and subsequently expanding to Hamburg and Vienna. Driven by fury over Allied bombings, Hitler elevated the construction of these towers to the highest priority. Issuing a decisive directive, Hitler orchestrated the logistical juggernaut needed to supply the colossal 1,600 tons of materials required for daily construction. Utilising forced labour, numerous towers were erected in astonishingly swift timeframes, some completed in less than six months. Despite the undeniable malevolence of the fascist regime, from an engineering standpoint, they demonstrated prowess in designing impressive foundations for these towers. The engineers devised a strategy involving the extensive use of sand to effectively disperse the relentless shock and impacts generated by the firing of the guns, safeguarding the concrete against potential cracking. Given the constraints of targeting technology, Allied bombers faced a critical vulnerability, navigating a steady approach in the final stages of their mission, exposing them to heightened risk. Evasive tactics became an unfeasible option for the bombers, amplifying their vulnerability in the decisive moments of the mission's final stages. Key positions were meticulously chosen for the deployment of defensive flak towers, often strategically positioned within urban landscapes. Given the towering height of many buildings, the guns had to be positioned at elevated locations to ensure the ability to freely fire in all directions, mitigating potential obstructions. The towers found additional purpose when thousands of civilians sought refuge during Allied bombing raids, providing them with an untouchable sanctuary against the onslaught of attacking forces. In a multifaceted role, some towers incorporated hospitals within their structures, addressing the inevitable injury sustained by German residents amid the unrelenting Allied bombing campaigns. The towers proved adaptable, serving as not just defensive structures, but also housing various facilities, such as workshops and basements equipped with electrical generators and freshwater supplies, showcasing their versatility in meeting various needs. Above the aforementioned facilities, the towers housed air conditioning rooms and essential production facilities. The uppermost floors were exclusively designed for military use, encompassing diverse facilities such as kitchens, storage rooms and quarters, illustrating a meticulous allocation of space for military needs within the towers. Flak towers were typically constructed in pairs, a command tower, or Leitturm, and a combat tower, or Gefechtsturm. The command towers typically accommodated radio and fire control equipment, while the combat towers were equipped with an array of guns. As a general rule, the towers were built in a triangular formation, strategically placing overlapping firearms in close proximity to city centres for enhanced defensive coverage. What lies before you is the Type 3 combat tower, the conclusive and final iteration within the series. This stands as the tallest and most modern variant of the Flak Tower, reaching an impressive height of 180 feet. The exterior wall boasts a substantial thickness of 8 feet, 
while the roof adds to the robust construction with a formidable 11.5 feet. As we approach, it becomes evident that the structure is comprised of conjointed flat faces, totaling 16 sides in its distinctive design. This ultimate tower deviates from the square configuration seen in the preceding types. Though some attribute the design change to bolstering strength, the true impetus behind the shift was the growing scarcity of supplies during the ongoing war. Enduring multiple direct hits, the tower's robust design as a non-single load-bearing structure ensured its remarkable ability to withstand the assault, standing defiant amidst the chaos of war. Simple, utilitarian, and industrialized, the towers exude an oppressive ambience, and the architectural design bears the unmistakable signature of the Nazis. At the summit of this tower, each of the four enclosures accommodated a twin 12.8 cm flat cannon. In the surrounding areas, spotlights and smaller anti-air guns could be strategically placed. Astonishingly, each tower had the capability to unleash a formidable 8,000 rounds per minute, highlighting its overwhelming and rapid-fire defensive capability. While the guns mounted on the defensive flat tower proved to be formidable adversaries, the undertaking proved to be an exceedingly expensive endeavour for the Wehrmacht. Beyond the initial investment of time and money in erecting the towers, their maintenance and operational costs were exorbitant. Between a quarter and a third of the Wehrmacht's ordnance and ammunition production was dedicated to sustaining the flak force. On average, 3,000 shots were fired for every downed Allied aircraft with the 12.8cm guns, and an astonishing 16,000 shots were recorded for every kill with the 8.8cm flat gun. This highlights the challenges and firepower involved in the air defence efforts. The toll on Allied bomber forces became absolutely devastating at times. The towers played a significant role in inflicting a substantial percentage of Bomber Command's casualties, persisting until the war's conclusion. The resources dedicated to countering the bombers must not be underestimated, but they proved to be far from cost-effective, leaving a substantial void in the Wehrmacht military spending budget. Despite the high cost of operations, the primary objective was to deny Allied bombers access to various military, industrial and civilian targets. Numerous raids were either called off or postponed due to intense flak, and the mere presence of the towers served as a potent deterrent, dissuading planned bombing operations on German infrastructure. Any aircraft entering its 10km range was almost certain to meet its demise. Amid the turning tides of 1945, the Nazis retreated into the heart of the Reich. During the siege of the Reichstag, the Berlin Zoo Tower redirected its focus from the skies to the advancing Soviet ground forces, initiating a barrage of powerful and precise firepower. Soviet tanks were swiftly reduced to smouldering scraps of metal, effectively halting their advance. The Soviets, recognising the threat, ordered the tower to be bombarded with their most potent weapon, a purpose-built, bunker-busting 203mm howitzer. Despite their weight, the 100 kilogram rounds demonstrated negligible impact. The Soviets instead opted for a strategic maneuver, choosing to circumvent these towers beyond their effective range. Subsequently, this approach paved the way for later negotiations and eventual surrender. As the war drew to a close, the reconstruction of Germany commenced under the guidance of both Allied and Soviet forces. In the extensive campaign of denazification led by the Allies, there was a concerted effort to demolish many of the structures erected by the Reich. Remarkably, despite numerous attempts to demolish these towers, many of them have endured and remain intact. In the present day, a multitude of these towers have been repurposed for various functions, serving as energy storage facilities, public spaces, or even nightclubs. 
There is no mistaking the undeniable efficiency and brutality of the Nazi war machine. A testament to the robustness of their construction, these structures stand as solemn sentinels, vividly embodying a dark and stained chapter in history that should never be forgotten. Despite evoking mixed feelings among people regarding their ongoing existence, they have found acceptance and have seemingly integrated into the fabric of modern urban landscape. But for others, they serve as gargantuan reminders of the most deadly and destructive war in human history.